it's interesting that you bring up consistency. You know, consistency is absolutely critical on certain areas. But on the other side, I think that, you know, as you become more mature, localization is an inevitable part of success, right? Within that specific market, within that specific area, within, because every single sort of business, there are definitely similarities. But as you go into different geographies, the culture is different, the way that people folks that, that people address and uh, will use your software or will use your product is going to be different. And so acknowledging that consistency is probably makes sense in some areas, but not as much in others. Welcome to Revenue Insights. Every week, we'll be joined by revenue leaders from some of the most successful and highest growing companies. Together, we explore how they built their revenue teams, the journeys that they've been on, and the lessons they have learned along the way. Revenue Insights is brought to you by Ebster. We're a revenue intelligence platform designed to help revenue teams to build more pipeline, close more deals, and retain more customers. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Revenue Insights podcast. Today, I'm joined by Namrata Ram, who is the VP of Sales Strategy and Operations at Slack. She's got over 10 years of experience running strategy and ops and was previously at LinkedIn and Hulik Packard. Nam, thank you for sharing some of your time. Excited to be here, Lee. So first things first, what, what's your story? What's your background? Yeah, let me take you back. So um, I grew up in Bangalore, which is, uh, I don't know, most of you guys know it as the IT capital of India. But uh, when I was growing up, it was a sleepy retirement town. And I literally saw the IT revolution transform the city. And so growing up, I was like, okay, I really want to be an engineer because I want to know what this is all about because it's completely changed the city that I live in. Um, and so I got my undergraduate degree in computer engineering. And my first job out of, uh, out of college was, um, was writing code software. Uh, I was a software developer for QuickBooks. Um, and so I really enjoyed that job. Um, and one of the, the key projects that I was working on back then was sort of taking the desktop version and moving it to online, which... I, you're like, okay, that really dates you. Uh, but uh, anyway, it was it was a really fun project. Um, while I was an engineer, one of the things I really enjoyed was the problem solving element and the impact that it was having, right? Um, uh, the thing though about engineering when you're working as an IC is that it's a very narrow scope that you have. Um, and until you get to the more senior levels of engineering, you don't have that breadth. And one of the things that I very quickly started um, yearning for was breadth. I said, okay, I really want to get like a bird's eye view of what's going on. And so found myself in business school and worked at BCG, uh, where I did everything from uh, working with financial services companies to pharma, to defense contractors, to all the, the to a fairly wide set of industries and a wide set of problems as well, right? Like from like cost efficiencies to investment strategies, as well as, you know, more ba back office operations uh, work as well. So I certainly scratched that itch around breath. I got that. Uh, but one of the things that it helped me realize was that I was, I really wanted to be back in the tech industry. Having come from the tech industry, I was like, okay, I want to go back. Because in many ways, I felt like the tech industry is the way that it treats customers and employees um, is very different and sometimes far more, you know, trendsetting in, in the way that it, uh, it, it, it approaches these problems. Um, and forward thinking, I would say. So I was excited to come back, landed in uh, LinkedIn and, uh, and did a bunch of strategy and ops roles there. So I worked in BizOps, which is your typical landing spot for any ex-consultant, and uh, also did a monetization, which is a pricing and packaging strategy, which was really interesting and exciting because it was so close to the impact that was driven for the business and top line revenue. And so that was very exciting as well. Um, and as I looked to grow my career, I was very, very, you know, excited about more of the go-to-market elements. I wanted to learn more about sales and marketing and continue to be a leader, a thought leader in the, in the strategy space. So when Slack reached out and we, said, we talked about a sales strategy role, I was like, yes, this is, this is it. I think that I can learn more here, grow more here, and really be able to drive an impact. And so it's been three years. No day has been the same, 
Uh, every single day is different, which is what I love about the job. And uh, I really have uh, have been excited to 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 drive um, all the different work and initiatives that are that are happening within the company. So I think that's very uh, synonymous of tech, right? Where where no day is the same. So now that you now that you are more mature, and I guess you're in the more challenging phase of it, um, yeah. what would you say is the biggest challenge like facing facing your sales function right now? Yeah, and I think that this isn't um, dissimilar to it. most folks are. I think facing this problem, which is especially in your, if you when you're still in a hyper growth environment, and uh, I guess as you reach a certain level of maturity, it's about scaling efficiently, right? And not scale for the sake of scale. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that you're constantly thinking about is, right, um, yes, we want to make significant headcount investments and people investments into the business, which is great, right? And I think that's the first thing people gravitate to words when people say scale. But it isn't just about that. It is about making sure that your processes as well as infrastructure is in place and is sufficiently scaling along with the organization because what might work for a 200 person organization may not work for a thousand person organization, right? And so you just have to be aware of that, aware that it's not just about, you know, headcount investments, but it is always about, it's also about processes as well as infrastructure. And I think the second thing is also about, it's, it's about scaling responsibly, right? Looking at when you made an investment looking at what is it going to take? Is it succeeding? What is it going to take to make it succeed? Stepping back and making sure that you're spending the time to do that is, again, incredibly important. So I think that as you continue to scale in any sort of hyper growth environment, most folks are cha- tackling this problem of how do you scale efficiently. Mm. And, and bringing that to obviously where you are now, would you say, um, would you say that creates issues around consistency and doing that like across the board um and i guess from the sense of you've got so many uh or gonna assume like multiple like global teams targeting different markets so how do you kind of create that consistency that also drives efficiency yeah i I, it's interesting that you bring up consistency you know consistency is absolutely critical on certain areas but on the other uh, on the other side i think that you know, as you become more mature, localization is an inevitable part of success, right? Uh, within that specific market, within that specific area, within because every single sort of um, business, there are definitely similarities. But as you go into different geographies, the culture is different. The way that people folks, that, that people address, um, uh, will use your software or will use your product is going to be different. And so acknowledging that consistency is probably makes sense in some areas, but not as much in others. For example, consistency is incredibly important for from a sales ops perspective when it comes to forecasting, maybe, you know, like your territory planning tool, making sure that it's the same thing that you're using, uh, making sure that, you know, when you're uh, essentially creating and um, sharing out some of um, the uh, the the systems and tools roll out. It's fairly consistently used across all the different uh, regions. Those parts totally make sense, and I think that there has to be a lot of ROE in place, as well as um, um, you know best practices that you want to roll out for the organization that makes complete sense. But on the other side, areas where consistency may not make sense is, for example, APAC might have more greenfield territories. And so how do you approach the sales model there? Do they, do they need more sales development resources? Do they need more supporting resources to develop the same sort of productivity as someone in a, in a, in a, in a place where there is far more mature customers, right? So as you go into different markets, understanding what is the unique aspects that, are, that, that require localization is, um, is incredibly important. And Consistency for the sake of consistency is not going to, you know, help us uh, get to where uh, we want, which is being able to scale efficiently. Amazing. And I, I think that point around like the tools and obviously the, t- the tech stack that you're using um, definitely brings us on to something that I'm sure a lot of the listeners will be really interested in, you know, um, and everyone obviously has a premise of, you know, you want to drink your own champagne. So in the case of Slack, obviously such a huge collaboration tool, you know, across many businesses around the world now. So how, how are you guys using it internally, um, you know, as a tool for collaboration, but also for, for consistency as well? Yeah. Um, and um, I think that, you know, this is something that uh, I, um, I, 
I have been completely wowed by, uh, you know, the, the, the capabilities. And I'm not saying this because, uh, you know, I work at Slack, but, you know, honestly, I'm a fairly cynical person. Like with any single technology that I'm using, I'm like, hey, you know, what is working, what is not? Um, and I think that uh, the possibilities and the platform that uh, Slack is, it can pretty much help you do a lot of different things. And especially in this hybrid environment, it is more relevant than ever. Um, and so as I, as I think about, you know, the two things that are really important in a hybrid environment, one is, you know, uh, making sure that information and learning are disseminated at the same pace, because, you know, previously we would go into the office through osmosis, you would learn, right? Hey, what's going on? What's the person next to you doing? You know, what's the best practices and, you know, all these different things you can have a con text someone into the room being like, hey, how did you do that? Or want to get your thoughts on this, right? So that's um, one piece, which is information and learning. And the second piece is really around community, right? You have that sense of community and culture. And um, I think that while while we're never going to fully replace that in office experience, we're all, we're going to have to find tools that get us pretty damn close. And, and so I think that uh, Slack does that. And I think that I've really enjoyed using it um, in many different ways. So for example, with, with, within the sales teams, there are lots of ways that the information and learning can happen, right? Uh, we have account channels for every single account. And there are different people swarming on these account channels. Like there is the CS person, there is the, um, the uh, sales development person, there is the AE. So there's strong teaming happening. And so there's always collaboration that happens. In addition to that, what we've plugged in is from our CRM and from our online usage uh, database, we are able to put in signals as to what's going on in that account. And so once they go into that account channel, they're able to see, hey, this contact from this specific um, uh, company attended this marketing event. And they're able to say, hey, person X, hey, my sales development person, can you reach out? and talk to them. And it's happening in a very timely manner, which is really interesting and exciting and really takes that collaboration and information to the next level, right? You're sending, you're feeding them timely signals into the place where they're working. So that's very exciting. The second thing is around, uh, you know, really being able to build community, right? Uh, we have a channel where deal wins are constantly shared and best practices are constantly shared. So people can celebrate each other's wins. People can talk about what's worked, what's not worked. And it um, is really key and important in building that sense of culture, community, celebrating wins, really calling out folks that have done an amazing job, saying thank you. Um, so there's this constant stream of things that are happening. At the same time, it helps with more like programmatic process work, which is like deal approvals, right? Uh, we created a deal channel where the pricing folks, all the different folks, revenue folks, all there, and you can create an automated process flow within Slack to approve deals. So in, in a number of different ways, both from like prospecting to celebrating the win, to actually thinking about quoting and pricing to celebrating the wins, it can all happen within Slack. And it is a really great platform where we can come together and uh, learn a lot of different things and, um, and celebrate, um, you know, the, the, the things that are going well. So uh, what I'm intrigued by is um, obviously a lot of the time for for reps uh, across you know sales and CS you know they spend a huge amount of time or in the, within their CRM. So for you guys, do you reckon that they uh, sp are spending more time in the CRM or actually spending more time in Slack because you've got so many insights being pumped into a single location? Yeah, and I think this is like the whole um, you know the the coming together of Slack and Salesforce, which is we really look at Slack as the engagement layer to the CRM, right? And Lee, you're in the marketing space and to the marketing cloud even, right? Which is like, there's all this information and signals that l live in these process, these systems of records. Um, and that we're bringing it into uh, the systems of engagement, right? And you're taking that information and you're plugging it in there. And so we really think that more and more work is going to happen directly within the, uh, the Slack tool as opposed to a Slack platform, as opposed to like people going in and having to check things. We're building in more and more functionality as time goes by where things can automatically be updated in chat, right? Um, in, the, in the channel, 
instead of having to go back in. So it's truly becoming the engagement layer where a number of different you know, conversations as well as action can happen um, within the platform. Yeah, it's really interesting, like hearing hearing you describe it as uh, I almost visualize it where you've got like the the underlayer of the CRM with, you know, how you're running Slack on the on top of it. Um, and even to many of the points that you're making r- reminds me, you know, certainly within the sales tech space of, you know, in the example of being able to use chat to actually update your CRM could be, you know, yeah. really powerful and also very seamless as well. Um, because I think a lot of the time, particularly with um, sales tech and MarTech, as I know very well, you know, you've got a million different tools that you're trying to use and it's just, it then exactly. just becomes incredibly inefficient um, to keep jumping from place to place. Absolutely. And it's not just the the CRMs uh, and the, or the systems of records, but it's also things like Gong. Like, for example, Say you're interested in, uh, you want to build, um, you know, uh, you want to learn about every single product conversation. Say you're in the product marketing team and you want to learn about every single conversation that the sales team is having having about a new product that's launched. You can literally put in like a signal saying, hey, if, if this word is said, channel that conversation into a channel. And then you can automatically filter through that and you get notified of it and you can immediately follow up with the AE and being like, hey, how was the conversation? Get more insights. You know, so there's a lot of different things where it really is helping unifying, unifying the go-to-market tech stack uh, and being the engagement layer where people can collaborate and be informed of different things that are happening in a more proactive way. So I'm interested to know, are you able to... Do you have some kind of way of measuring, you know, the impact of, you know, the level of what that level of collaboration brings in the sense of, I love what you're saying around, you know, engagement. It's something that, that we here at EBSA are obviously really passionate about as well, you know, in terms of being able to measure it. And so I wonder whether, you know, having all of that, that insight coming into a single location, where's a, from an ops side, where's a, you're able to go, yep, yeah, since we've been able to, you know, in the case of Gong, being able to pull those calls in, are you seeing that that's uh, resulting in more closed deals? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, that's one of the things that is hardest in my job is correlation causation. <laughs> so, you know, it's very hard to like tie the exact, you know, uh, specific things that help you close a deal. But I think that there are certain behaviors that have invariably helped us do more. So the signals coming in, right, at the in the account channel in that timely moment has helped us drive more opportunities, right? So that has helped seriously drive like more top of funnel like conversations amongst the AEs because they now know like, hey, Lee, who is who is driving this awesome webinar with all these customers, uh, has had a great conversation. And by the way. This person, this person attended all these webinars. So I should go and talk to them and understand, was it interesting? Was it, was it relevant for them? And so those conversation starters are happening. And as a, so at the very top of funnels, we are seeing like a better like opportunity creation rate from just the signals that are coming in, right? So that's one. The second thing is around uh, close rates, right? The collaboration and teaming and the timely interactions that are happening helps them deal moves faster. Right, because everybody's in the know. Everybody can collaborate. Everybody can bring that information in and come together as one team uh, in a much faster way. And as a result of that, it is moving deals faster. And so it is. While it's very hard for me to say like X and Y Lee helped improve the close rates, we have seen certain actions and behaviors empirically improve some leading indicators that um, you know help with more closed uh, revenue. Amazing. Um... I think we're going to have to look at investing a bit more in Slack internally. Sounds great. Um, I want to I want to ch- uh, change to a slightly different topic, um, and and more specifically, obviously, given the state of the of the market at the minute, and I suppose for as you kind of touched on before, with more of a shift towards you know hybrid models happening, um, particularly within you know revenue teams. Um, what would you say is the biggest problem that you're trying to solve at the minute? Yes, the biggest problem that we're trying to solve and goes back to the whole, again, scaling efficiently piece is um, as we bring in more uh, new members within the go-to-market team, onboarding is very, very different, right? Enablement and onboarding is very, very different of these new folks where they're, it's all going to be remote. You don't have like that osmosis that I told you about. While Slack's a great tool to help with some of that, it cannot fully like bridge the, the issues at hand. 
Um, and so I think one of the biggest problems that we are trying to solve is how do we take the, the best practices that we're seeing with our tenured AEs, right? In terms of both what is the right level of effort that needs to be put in and what is the right quality or the, the type of interactions that they're having and taking those best practices and helping very deliberately enable that knowledge transfer to, uh, to the folks that are coming on board uh, newly because it's not happening organically anymore. They're not getting in a room and saying, hey, they could be getting on a Zoom call or they could be getting on a huddle uh, to Slack huddle to actually talk about this. But the thing is that uh, you have to be a little more proactive and deliberate about ensuring that um, you know the folks that are coming on board are ramping and are like being onboarded in a in the way that um, that is going to allow them to be far more capable and efficient uh, quickly. And um, and so I think that taking some of the best practices, firstly understanding what those best practices are, because I don't think that we spend enough time understanding what is working, right? What is the thing that's working? We spend all this time on what is not working. But the thing is like, what is working? And sometimes, and especially in this environment where, you know, everybody is facing different kinds of pressures, it's really important to understand what is working and then seeing whether we could do more of what is working and, and share those best practices. And so that for me is top of mind and is, is something that I'm working through. Um, and uh, I, I really have um, have enjoyed a lot of the the reflection as well as uh, the analysis that has gone into it. And I, I appreciate that you're working through it at the minute, but are you able to share perhaps what some of those best practices are for onboarding that you've kind of learned so far? Yeah, best practices for onboarding. I think that, um, you know, one of the things that has really worked for us is that we all think of, you know, enablement as a silver bullet, right? Somebody goes through a training and that's it. Boom, they're enabled. Fact is like, we all go through trainings. How much do you retain? Maybe like 10, 20% at best, right? Uh, and I don't have the exact stat, but I know that it's not not very high. And so like, how do you create moments and practice sessions where people can learn by doing? And so one of the things that we are doing that has really helped is not just putting folks in, um, you know, in enablement sessions, but after that, creating like programs that help them learn how to do it. For example, we have something known as a pipe up session where we bring AEs together and we say, here are the best practices for prospecting, right? We talked about this in your onboarding session. We have all this content for you. We have these experts for you. Now let's spend these two hours doing it and come back together as a team and talk about what has worked versus not, right? Um, so I think that that is incredibly important and has worked and because you're creating these practice sessions where they're coming together, actually doing the job and then step, you're giving them the best practices of you know what to do in that moment. And then you're seeing, did it work? Did it not work? And that in itself creates this uh, motion. So it's like this ongoing practice sessions that are very deliberate that will help them on board in a more meaningful way. And I think that has been truly um, game changing. Uh, I, I love that. Um, uh, it's very top of mind for, for me at the minute as well, you know, even from like a marketing sense, it's very easy when onboarding, you know, just to have someone, you know, stood at the front talking away. And uh, I, I don't think you're a million miles off with, you know, retaining 10 to 20% either, because, um, you know, very used to doing sessions myself. And I kind of, you can tell from people's body language, right, where it's just like, okay, there's not a huge amount like going in there. So completely, completely agree with your point. So aside from that, you know, going looking more broadly um, and within um, kind of uh, in the revenue space at the minute, is there perhaps a single piece of advice, you know, actionable advice that you would want mm -hmm. to share today that for, for people to improve how they're running things? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, these are these are times where there's a lot of challenges that are out there. There are a lot of things that are coming at your sales team, lots of marketing campaigns, a lot of, you know, uh, best practices, lots of enablement sessions coming at them. I think that, um, you know, it's really important to prioritize what is truly driving impact versus not. Uh, because I think that while there isn't a silver bullet, right, uh, on in terms of like, this is the one thing I need to do, and that's the only thing that I need to do. I think that it's important to actually sift through 
and actually understand like what is the impact of what I'm going to be doing, right? If I take this training, what will I learn about? Okay, great. This is and and that if I learn about this, what is it going to help me do? Um, and so I think that it's really incredibly important to build or give prioritization frameworks to not just you know your own sales ops teams to do stuff because sales ops itself is like you're getting pinged a million miles uh, about a million things. Uh, but it's also uh, uh, for the sales teams because they're hearing about 20 different signals and different things. It's really important to be able to create um, a framework where you prioritize what what matters and what doesn't. So I think that that is um, my advice to, to folks out there. Yeah, I love the idea of, of the framework um, and, and in particular, like what goes into it. So is there, could you give like some examples of perhaps what goes into your framework? Yeah, for, for my team, yes. Um, I think that uh, it's it's definitely one of those things where uh, we have uh, uh, we have a lot of a uh, lot of things that are coming at us, right? Right from like an AE pinging us to say, "Hey, by the way, like this isn't working for my my opportunity it needs to be updated," or like this isn't working for this specific deal, and um, or things like, "Hey, the leaders are asking about what is the temp penetration." What is uh, what is growth looking like? What is the long wage plan, right? Um, and so I think that it's in, in, in important for us to for us to be able to understand what are the things that are micro, right? Uh, that are incredibly. And this goes back to the urgency and importance matrix, right? Uh, and so if you have those two axes, and I am having been an XPCG or I love two by twos, um, so uh, <laughs> there is the ur- very urgent and very important ones, right? Um, and so I think being able to see what are those ones and those are your top priority ones that you can go after. What are the urgent but not important ones? Um, I think that that's an area where you really be, need to be able to think about, is there somebody else that can help with this or should you be helping with this? Because of the fact that it is it is not as important in the important scale, um, and I, I can give examples for each one. And then if it's like truly important but not urgent, like I think if you move the needle at least ten percent every single week versus you know having to spend like fifty percent of your time on it, I think it's it's incredibly important to just make like incremental progress on it as you go through the thing versus like spending all your time there. So I think that it's really important to figure out what falls in each one of these buckets, right? Um, so for example, the urgent and important could be like a um, QBR that you need to deliver to um, the, the leaders, right? That is going to inform investments, that is going to inform like funding, um, all those different things, right? Or a business review, a board review that you're doing. Um, and so that falls in your top bucket. Spend all your energy there, like or not a good chunk of your energy there. I think that's incredibly important. The urgent but not important or not super, uh, you know, scaled important could be like one single person asking you about one small thing, which is incredibly urgent for them, but then not as immediate, uh, not as the impact of it solving it is not necessarily going to be as scaled. So then thinking about are there scalable processes that you can build over time that can help this person as opposed to like, you know, just answering every single ping that you get is incredibly uh, key to do. And then for the ones that are important, but not as urgent, for example, you may have to find out what's the overall opportunity like, what's the TAM, uh, what is the the broader trajectory of the business. Spend like time box your week to say, hey, spend no more than two or three hours per week doing this, but make progress on it because it's important you need to make progress. You just don't need to be spending all your time right now. Um, and so that is how um, I, uh, that's the framework that I've given most of my team to help prioritize um, the work that they're doing. You, you actually just answered what my follow-up question was going to be because like hearing it back, I could I could literally see like was prioritization and urgency um, uh, literally mapped out on a graph. And I, I actually love that you've kind of rolled out across your team as well. And um is that something that did, I assume they find it useful also? I think they do. I think. <laughs> they tell you they do. <laughs> I think they do. I know my managers find, me, find it useful because this is something that I constantly bring up for them, which is like, hey, you have to help them prioritize. You have to help ICs prioritize. And sometimes I like to empower my team with their own prioritization framework, which is if they can do it themselves, then they don't need their managers to do it. 
But the only difference is the perspective of what is important and what is urgent can be v- different based on who is prioritizing. Um, and so that's where it's, it's important to come together both as managers as well as you know folks on the team and really understand and align on does this make sense or not. So it is it has helped them for sure. Uh, but I think that there are differences in opinion of what constitutes urgent and important for sure. <laughs> yeah, 100%. <laughs> Penultimate question. Obviously, I appreciate when we're recording this, we're in July currently. I think this will probably come out in August. Um, but looking ahead to 2023, and obviously within your role of obviously sales strategy as well as ops, um, is there one kind of crucial aspect that you're looking at from a strategic perspective going into next year that, well, the one that you're able to talk about, um, but is really front of mind for you at the minute? Um, in terms of what we're thinking about for FY23, for the 2023. Um, yeah, I think that one of the things that, um, you know, Slack's really to, looking to um, invest pretty significantly is in, um, you know, some of the, 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 the different connection points between Salesforce and Slack, right? Um, and so there's already a bunch of different connectors that we're building in around, like I mentioned before, opportunity management and like account channels being automatically created and information from the opportunity object being pulled into Slack itself. I think that as time goes by, that this is going, this, the connection points between the two are only going to get richer. And I'm incredibly excited about that because it really allows, um, you know, efficiency and productivity um, that is that hasn't been that I haven't seen before. Um, and I, I truly believe it. And I, I tr- ex- having experienced it, I think that there's so much more that we could be doing. So I'm incredibly excited about the fact that um, we are bringing together a sort of Slack for sales solution and a Slack for service solution that is um, is going to be fairly game-changing as we think about bringing folk, the, diff- the different pieces of the tech stack together for these these personas into Slack. I'm fascinated to, uh, especially, I'm fascinated to hear more, especially based off of what we were talking earlier. Um, I wasn't even sure it was possible to <laughs> integrate it even more. So it'll be fascinating to see what's coming. Um, final question, Nam. Um, um, and a little bit of a lighter one. Uh, if there's one book that you'd recommend to other, you know, sales and ops leaders out there, what would it be and why? One book that I would recommend, um, and what would it be and why? Well, um, I really like um, a number of different books. Uh, one is, um, I think, Influence. I don't know if you've heard uh, mm-hmm. of that. I've heard of- um, and I, I have been listening to it and I've been listening to it as an audiobook because I have better auditory retention than, uh, reading it. So I have like really as in my role as a sales ops leader, half your, it's, it's all about, you know, influencing sales leaders and acting as an advisor to sales leaders, right? Cause you don't truly own the outcome or the number. Uh, and so that has been incredibly important to me. Um, and I think that that is a, a book that um, a lot of like rev ops slash sales ops or strategy and ops folks will find um, really useful because I think that understanding there are different types of ways of influencing people um, and, um, you know, helping shape their opinions and perspectives. So is, um, is, is has been very um enriching for me to lead I'm, I'm i'm pleased to hear that suggestion uh usually when i ask ask this one um i get such an array back which um and this is one where i'm like yes i've actually read this one and actually you know to, to add to your point i think it's super relevant for you know anyone working really in the business space you know i'd extend it where it's super super relevant in in marketing as well you know i think we're all kind of in the business of ultimately influencing right um particularly you know understanding the the psychology of it um to be able to do our roles so i would exactly it's it's been game changing for me to read i would i would second it okay now it's been great to have you on um final thing because we were chatting about before i'm hoping to hear you on more podcasts than just hours you know to everyone listening that they want to hear more about um what you're doing at slack and, and more of your kind of opinions um where can they find you yeah, I am. Um, I'm definitely very active on LinkedIn. 
So feel free to send me a message, a LinkedIn message, and I'm always excited uh, to connect and have and learn more about what, what's going on with you guys. We'll be sure to um, put a link to Nam's LinkedIn down in the uh, down the show notes. And on that note, uh, no pun intended. Uh, thank you so much um, f- again for joining me. Um, it's been a great conversation. Um, and thank you to everyone listening. Um, we'll see you again next week. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thanks for listening to Revenue Insights. If you want to learn more, subscribe to our newsletter and we'll deliver every episode straight to your inbox. If you have any questions, feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. Our links will be in the episode notes. See you next week.